Now my last example, which is the painting I promised to talk about, it's the so-called Pass and Treasure. It's a large um, oil painting on canvas. It's also a rare record of a cabinet of treasures in British collecting. Um, it was commissioned by Sir Robert Paston in the second half of the 17th century, probably painted by a Dutch artist. Um, and it depicts some of the families, the Paston family's treasures collected um, during travels, um, not just in Europe, but as far as um, Cairo and Jerusalem. And the Paston treasure it was acquired by Norwich Museum Castle in 1947, where it's currently on display, where it was analyzed at, the, at, the, at Norwich Castle Museum um, last April. Um, with the macro X-ray scanner developed in Catania. The painting will be the subject of an exhibition next year um, and Norwich Castle Museum in partnership with the Yale Center um, for British Art in the US are trying to reunite as many of the objects depicted um, as they can together with the painting for the first time in 350 years. Um, and Spike has been um, researching the painting for the exhibition. Now, before we look at the elemental maps, um, this is the X-ray graph of the painting. Um, they, they did infrared imaging as well before they conserved the painting recently, but it just didn't do much for this painting. So I'm not, I'm not showing you that image. But the X-ray graph is interesting because it shows a number of things, including two subsequent changes um, to this area on the right-hand side. So if we look closer, that's what you see on the left is what the painting looks like now. Um, and here on the right, you see um, a large oval shape, which is likely to have been a sort of large platter dish. Um, and in the same area, you can distinguish the figure of a woman. And this woman um, was clearly in the original version of the picture and painted up later. Um, she's most likely to be the wife of Robert Paston, who commissioned the painting, and the mother of um, Mary, who's the little girl depicted at the center of the painting. This is the map for cobalt, um, which suggests uses smalt as a blue pigment, um, which is not the only blue pigment used, uh, because it doesn't account, in the map, it doesn't account for all the blue areas present. But it does appear, if you see, along the edge of the platter. So we can hypothesize that that was um, a blue and white Chinese porcelain type dish. Um, just like there's another little one behind the little girl's head of these blue and white porcelain dishes. So we can, um, we can suggest that that was what that platter might have looked like um, as well. I should say um, that in terms of blue, ultramarine blue was found in a lot of areas um, in the painting by other methods, um, but it doesn't show up um, in decay map. Potassium map is dominated by areas of smalt and areas of lakes, where there's more potassium, and so those absolutely dominate the map. I'm guessing possibly doing a bit more extraction, working on the map a little bit more, we might be able to pick up the ultramarine but um, if you just look at the map, there just isn't enough uh, potassium in the ultramarine to, to be able to map it as a pigment. And again, the silicon and aluminium maps are just too noisy um, to be of any use. Now, if we go back to the, the overpainted area, and we combine the maps for um, mercury, copper, and cobalt, um, you can start to see that the woman probably had a red corset. Um, she's got bright red lips. Um, she's got blue ribbons or feathers in her hair, possibly, and a green or blue copper-based sort of sash. So we can start to um, think about how she might have been dressed, what she might have um, looked like. If we look at red and yellow pigments, so arsenic and iron, um, it's interesting to note that a lot of the golden um, objects in the image were, um, were painted using arsenic sulfide pigments, but some of them weren't um, at Earth's we use instead. And it's something that if you just look at the painting, it's not immediately apparent. Um, and again, the map really helps um, in that case. There's also sort of a concentration of the arsenic sulfide pigment towards the center of the painting, while the earths are used more in the periphery. But I'm gonna let Spike elaborate on that later, if he wants to. The mercury map is interesting because, also because it proves that lots of areas which currently appear um, very pale, uh, almost bleached out, must have been bright red, and um, the lobster is a case in point. She's not as red as she's supposed to be, really. Um, so there, there must have been some kind of probably um, degradation process going on, and again, this is something one could investigate more, because um, all that mercury suggests that she would have been a lot redder, um, and that makes sense visually as well. And finally, the calcium um, map, um, amongst other things, um, shows the conservation treatment that went on, all the infills that were added to the painting. And now my um, 
final slide, this is the copper map. We of course find copper and green pigments, but copper was also used in low amounts as a secative in oil paint. Now, despite the low amount um, in which you usually find it in, as a secative, um, you can see it really clearly in the smoke um, coming up from the extinguished um, candle. Um, so the smoke <coughs> probably comes in the carbon black, to which verdigris dissolved in oil was added as a secative. Um, and though it's hardly visible uh, with the naked eye on the actual painting, um, this thin column of smoke um, is clearly identifiable in the elemental map. And actually, this is important because together with the hourglass and the clock, um, the snapped out candle represents the passing of time, which is one of the central themes of the painting. Um, and that things which I won't be discussing now, um, but if you're interested, you can definitely find more about them in the exhibition next year. Um, and I think I'm going to stop here.